Well, welcome to you all. Um, so we're here, this session is on open infrastructures for opening access to higher education. Uh, my name is Jim Baxter and, and my job is to facilitate this particular session. I'm uh, working in partnership with Jed here who is uh, looking after uh, the, the people that are online. Um, and uh, to that end, um, could we just go to the people online? So, so the people in the room have got a sense of who's online. Uh, and, and those of you who are online, if you could put your cameras on, that'd be very much appreciated and then we could see you. Oh, that's me. <laughs> that's definitely you. Oh, that's you. <laughs> Hello, I, I'm, I'm guessing there's more than one person online. Yes, I have three cameras on. I think that was John Mario, yes? How are we doing with this? There you go. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so the, the, the thing we need to do this afternoon in the next oh, probably 55 minutes now is to come up with three things that can be done to make a difference when it comes to open infrastructures for open access to higher education. So that's going to be my focus. We're going to do that in, in the following way. We're going to have two presentations. Um, uh, and, and the presenters, you've got eight to ten minutes. If you keep to that, that'll be really helpful. And then we'll go into a discussion around the challenges and, in particular, identifying uh, solutions. So, uh, if that's all okay with you, let's let's pile into it, Paul. So, let me welcome Paul Connell, who's founder of Open Innovations, and, and provoke us, please, Paul. Okay. Let's go. Uh, okay. So, my name's Paul Connell, I'm founder of Open Innovations. I've got a thing that makes the slides go backs and forwards, apparently. There we go, that's me. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about us, Open Innovations, our work and our mission. I'm gonna give you some examples of what we've done. Um, I'm gonna tell you a bit of what we've learned and I might challenge you, hopefully. And then hopefully you're gonna ask some hard questions. Uh, this is us, um, everything we do is on the web. Um, and you can see what we are. We are a not-for-profit, independent, mission-led, radically open, open organisation. Um, it's completely self-funding, which gives us a load of um, uh, freedom to operate. And we use open data to innovate and help people make better decisions with a mission. That's where we are. If you know Leeds, we're on the top floor of Munro House. And we do innovation. So... Um, if you have access to the slides, I've sent them through. These are all links to our Open Data Saves Lives work, our Open Transport Wealth work, our work on diversity data, our work on levelling up for the UK, and our work with the Northern Lands. So if you are from the Netherlands, we've been uh, partnering with the Kingdom of Netherlands to connect across the North Sea, and we've come up with hashtag Northern Lands. So we've done four Northern Lands conferences where we have been connecting people doing stuff with data and sharing it openly and radically openly at that. Two live examples of work we're doing right now are the Leeds 2023 Year of Culture and our work with the Youth Futures Foundation, which is all about creating equity of employment um, opportunity for everybody. And those two are great examples. Um, I don't know if, can we access the links on those? No. Right, okay. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to tweet these out in a minute, and you can access the links yourselves. But the, these are basically microsites where we are, help, we are publishing data, we're publishing story blogs, we're publishing technical blogs about the operation of these um, programs. But you could imagine they might be a research paper, or you could imagine they might be a research program, and you could imagine they might be a website for each of them. But so what? So we've done loads of cool stuff. This is one of the messages I want to take away, is use the web as it was intended and be radically open. We have, we, in our work, we've completed zero white papers, we've done no think pieces, we haven't just talked about stuff, we do hardly any roundtables where people chat. We write blogs about important stuff, 
We have repos where our data and code is, and we build tools that are important and useful. And we just talked to the, the session over there about uh, reward um, and recognition for work is, is really interesting for me because um, if things exist, they're real, people can find them on the web, they are so much more valuable than a really, really powerful um, piece of work that's hidden in a book that no one's read. If it exists on the web, it exists. If it's not, it may as well not exist. And you may have a better argument, but if you can't find it, and it's not easy to find, who has the better, uh, who has more impact, I guess. So why do we do this? Why are we radically open? It's good for business. Open doesn't mean free. You have to really understand that. It doesn't mean free, but it should mean faster and it should mean better and it should mean cheaper. Not just for the people who are engaging with you or using your stuff or uh, accessing your data or your thinking or whatever you've done, but yourself as well. It, it, makes, it probably gives you more time and space to do what you need to do because you're creating reproducible patterns, you're creating easier ways of doing things. You do it once, you can do it a hundred times. It means people can find us. So we have five permanent staff and five associates, but I am always amazed by the reach of our brand, the reach of our work, the fact that we're recognised and repeated back to us uh, by government in the UK, by governments across uh, Europe, and, and even further afield now. But that's just a small team of five permanent, five associates. But because we're on the web and people can find us and we're doing interesting work, and we ask for feedback really early on in our work. So it's not just at the end of the process where you publish it openly, it's right at the start. So announcing that I am starting this work, it is really interesting, would you like to find us? Um, and maybe getting it slightly wrong to start off with so you can get it right in the future. It's a massive benefit to how we run our organisation. And this is one of the other parts that I want people to take away. The benefits of being open are not to people external to your organisation first. First and foremost, they're to your organisation and how you work and bringing equity of access of power in the organisation itself. So being open takes away power from the usual uh, leaders or um, uh, people in control of situations it really provides equity of access to the what's going on in the organisation, what have you found out, who is interested in your work across all parts of the organisation. And this is not just the researchers, from what I can tell, but it's also for everyone who's engaging with you, so the people who are going to um, help you do your work, um, organise your work internally. If they've already seen you publish what you're doing, they can normally second-guess what you're going to need to help and they might say, oh, well, this is what we did last time, this is what we're going to do now. So you're 80% along the way. So be radically open and this is the other one, kill all reports. Build websites. Don't write reports. If you're radically open, you can create the massive surpluses around your work, which might be economic, they might be social, they might be <laughs> civic benefit. But if it's not available and people can't find it, you are not going to ac access all of those spin-off or adjacent benefits from your work. You might guess about it, and you might say in your evaluation that people could, if they wanted, would do blah, 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 but it is just talk, unless people can find it. And then the last bit, if you are radically open, you will find friends and people or organisation you've not met yet. So they will read your stuff, and then maybe six months later, when they, they're starting to work on stuff, they'll use a search engine um, to find other people who are doing stuff, and they'll find you. They might find you on social media when you're talking about it. They might think, I'm, I'm going to work on that in six months, 12 months. When they're ready, they'll contact you. So they'll reach into your project without you ever meeting them. And if it's good, they'll, they'll get involved. So three questions I want to ask you, yourselves, and maybe ask other people when you get back. Where, what, what data does your organisation release? Where can you find it? And also, why aren't you releasing more data? Because if you do that, well, you can answer me, it's going to help you work together. It will, it will definitely help you do better research and also forget about IP. It's just chat. It really is, because unless you're going to willing to invest 
the same, maybe double, maybe triple the amount in the research in a business framework program, in a um, sales force, in a testing and prototyping uh, thing or process for your work, you might as well not bother. You, uh, you're going to get more value by giving that away or making it able for people to use that. So when they do, they're going to come to you to implement whatever you've built. And that's your commercial opportunity. Wrapping it up in some mad IP wrapper is like putting it in a, um, a, a set of drawers and hiding it at the back of the library and expecting someone to come along and say, oh, I'm going to pay you two million quid for that. So I did think we are going to do questions for me now, but we're not. We're going to do another provocation. Then we're going to do this crazy hybrid thing in a second. OK, so thanks very much. Paul, thank you. And, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure you're, what you said about uh, making things easy to find will be uh, music to Masood's ears. Um, so uh, next up, we've got uh, Gian Mario Bessana, uh, who is the Vincent Paul Professor in the College of Computing and Digital Media at DePaul University. And I'm hoping my colleagues at the back can, can bring Gian Mario up onto the screen for us. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you today as we continue to reflect on how we collectively can contribute to the concrete implementation of the vision of the Knowledge Equity Network. I join you from DePaul University, a private institution in the United States, whose ethos and mission of enhanced access to quality education for all particularly for disenfranchised and underrepresented populations, needs to come to grips daily with the reality of escalating costs and substantial reliance on student fees. I say this at the outset as what I'm going to offer to our common reflection today is unavoidably colored by the context in which I operate and by its present constraints. Uh, constraints that may in some cases appear quintessentially American and may need a bit of translation and adjustments to other realities, <clears throat> to your own realities. As we work towards the ultimate goal of an open knowledge ecosystem, I feel strongly that our collective responsibility is to start implementing realistic steps towards achieving universal, collaborative, inclusive, and sustainable higher education. We cannot just sit and wait for the perfect tomorrow. We need instead to strive for the good today. And this for me personally means dealing with a system in which free or affordable higher education is not a visible reality at all. This is the ultimate infrastructure obstacle, but changing the way in which higher education is financed in the United States requires a long and difficult political battle. That is the perfect tomorrow. But what can I do today, given the current circumstances, while I continue to fight for the perfect tomorrow? I feel strongly that through concrete, practical attempts at implementing aspects of a more open system of global higher education, we actually learn exactly where the infrastructure-related barriers are that we can try to conquer today. As a result, today, I feel that we can adopt two different but complementary approaches. On one hand, we can identify and fight the infrastructural battle to change things and remove obstacles. On the other, we can find clever ways to operate within existing infrastructures, transcending where possible their limitations. And I'm going to give two uh, concrete examples. The first one is the virtual exchange coil movement. If you're not familiar with the collaborative online international learning model, in a nutshell, it consists of learning experiences designed collaboratively by usually two academics 
in two different parts of the world, that engage students in mixed groups, in collaborative projects with clearly defined learning outcomes and very often with clearly identified deliverables, where a sustained communication and collaboration takes place among students. This model transcends the infrastructural difficulties of credit transfer, money exchange, privilege access to global network of institutions, access to sophisticated technologies, relying instead on basic willingness of individual academics to open their classroom to other realities around the world. In trying to implement this model, one learns quickly where several other obstacles lie. One simple poignant example, all of our institutions are more and more relying on learning management systems. Most of these are or become after implementation, closed proprietary ecosystems for many reasons, security, the need for data protection, desire for data collection on our students and so on. The simple action of having two groups in two different institutions, in two different countries, using two different LMSs, trying to collaborate, surfaces a, a whole series of impediments. What to do? Yes, we can fight the noble fight and try to uh, advocate <clears throat> and work for a more flexible, shareable structure of learning management system. I'll say a word about this in a second. But what many of our practitioners of virtual exchange COIL do is they find or create third spaces outside of either LMSs in which students collaborate, transcending again this obstacle. In the meantime, there is hope for the solutions of interoperability of LMSs that is emerging as the various LMS providers have heard the call for easier collaboration. And we have experimented now a couple of times with the possibility of connecting two different LMSs in a much simpler and, and more nimble and flexible uh, way. So again, this, this duality, right? The, the, the fight for infrastructural improvement towards open access and more collaborative um, approaches to higher education. On the other hand, though, trying to find a way to overcome the current situation. While most of the first implementations of virtual exchange COIL projects were between institutions in the global north, working with institutions in the global south, with English almost always as lingua franca, now, the movement is witnessing an explosion of Global South to Global South collaborations, in many of which Spanish is the lingua franca. So this first example give you uh, uh, a, a view of a movement that is open, not universal yet, admittedly, but definitely collaborative and inclusive. The second example I wanna use is the global conversations. These are cycles of 90 minutes synchronous conversations held on Zoom, led by teams of academics from different institutions around the world, open and free for students from any institution around the world. Each conversation engages students on a topic of global relevance from global health issues to urban design to some of the uh, sustainable development goals and many more. The DePaul Global Engagement Team started offering this platform in the spring of 2020 as a partial response to the pandemic. And now this initiative has taken a life of its own. The last cycle took place in October, 2022 with 16 different conversations attended by 656 students from 70 different institutions from 28 different countries facilitated by 47 academics from 17 different institutions from 13 different countries. I'm not listing these figures just to boast, uh, but uh, to make the point that sometimes a simple, slightly unorthodox idea that again transcends the strictures of existing infrastructures 
resonates with the appetite of many and can move the needle. What infrastructure obstacle do we encounter? Honestly, just a very American perspective that these efforts use up a significant amount of staff time, but in the end generate no revenue. But sometimes you need to push the envelope a bit to achieve broader goals. These conversations are completely open, have the potential to be universal, they're certainly inclusive, and their sustainability depends on the willingness of many partners in the world. I'm going to stop now with a couple of very direct questions and provocations for all of you that hopefully will stimulate the conversation uh, for this hour. What can you, in your position, whether you're a faculty member, an academic, or a staff person involved in supporting the academic enterprise do today? What infrastructural obstacles are you encountering? And what can you do on one hand to try to change things and at the same time, what can you do to overcome these obstacles today, right now? In what conversations and decision-making processes at your local level, at your institutional level, maybe for some of you at the national and global level, are you involved today where you can make a difference in changing the infrastructures or in transcending the current limitations? I'm looking forward to your thoughts and ideas. And for now, I thank you very much for your attention and willingness to engage with this process. So thank, thank you, Gian Mario there. Um, the, the, the thing that uh, Jan reminded me of was some work I did over 20 years ago where we had a group of students working in Arizona State and, and a group of students working here at Leeds and the, the, them working on a project together. And I think the thing that struck me about them reflects what Mario was saying, was that they were very good at finding their own solutions. Um, OK, so... To the discussion, just, just some uh, uh, ground rules around the discussions. Um, the focus here is to identify solutions to the challenges. So I'll be interested in hearing what you, the challenges are, but I particularly want you to focus on solutions. Um, the aim is to get three solutions that we can take forward uh, by quarter past three. Um, for those of you online, if you could please keep your cameras uh, switched off and microphones off until instructed to turn them on, that would be appreciated. Um, those of you in the room, could you please refrain from having small group conversations because they'll be missed by the wider audience because the, the microphones don't work um, unless they're in front of your mouth. Um, if uh, you're an in-person participant and, and want to speak, if you put your hand up and then wait for Tom to get to you with the microphone when I've, I'm di I've directed him to you, then that way we can all get to hear what you're saying. Um, if you're online, please could you indicate in chat that you, you'd like to ask a question uh, and put your hand up and Jed will keep an eye on that and we'll... Al Excellent. Um, in fact, we might start there, Jed, if that's, if that's okay with you. Um, is that all okay? Yeah, right. Brilliant. So it's David online. Okay, David. David, would you like to ask your question, please? Or make your comment? Or suggest your solution? Um, I'm speaking from Mas Malawi University of Science and Technology. I, I can hear you, yes, welcome. An alumni of Leeds University. Um, I've been participating and um, I would like first of all contribute to the Open University presentation and uh, by giving you a background of what we are doing here in Malawi. We have what we call Community Innovation Program. Uh, this is a program where we identify innovators that have never been to the university or have never been to school. Uh, we bring their innovative ideas into the university ecosystem, uh, match them with their mentors until they prototype or commercialize innovations. Now the concept of open inno innovations, I think is directly linked to infrastructure or support to digital space. 
For me, this is a problem. As such, I seriously think that uh, at a global level, we need to find out how indigenous knowledge can also reach to the wider public platform, especially the ideas that if given the right investment, they can create employment, reduce poverty, and maybe even engage the youth into productive space. My question to the presenter on open innovations, where there is no digital infrastructure, what should we do to make sure that uh, the community or the indigenous innovations are given the right global attention? Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Okay, um, so uh, the, the challenge there was if, if you don't have a computer or internet connection, how do you engage with the wider community? Um, so I, so I say that. Yes, please do, Paul. So you were looking struggling. So um, <laughs> you, the pictures of uh, us in our space, when we first started almost 10 years ago, our original, we, we didn't have anything online. We didn't have a website, we didn't have anything. What we had was a big room and we had boards on there. And what we did was we just put projects and work and we shared it in a communal space and we invited people to come for coffee or beer. That's it. You, so you have to create a space where people can share openly and they feel safe to do so. If you create a um, uh, independent, so we talk about a um, non-aligned uh, neutral space that's not a university or it's not a local government and it's not a PLC, it's not, it's not, not any of those things. So you have to create something that is neutral and non-aligned and people are welcome. And the way we did it was to find a, a space that had hosted um, not quite illegal raves, but it was a big warehouse, and that's where we started. And we had some big boards, <coughs> and we got people to share their projects, um, and that's how, it, that's how we started. So you don't need the web, but you do need a neutral space, and you do need to have a commitment to share and let people view and, and, and join in. Does that help? Can't like that, 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 that's, that's great. Okay, so we've got, I'm gonna to take Tom's, Tom's lead here. Let's come to the front first. Um, just tell us, tell us who you are, so the rest of the room knows who's, who's talking, please. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Knowles, and I'm the Associate Library Director for Research and Digital Futures here at the University of Leeds. And I think that's where, if people can get online, often it may be by their phone. And when you're at a big, um, institution and particularly here in the UK where we have amazing internet access which is far better here at the university than it is at my house um, we forget sometimes that people may be looking at things and trying to find things on a small device um, not very many pixels etc and we need to look at things through that lens as well when we are testing things and what we put available and how that is and I think that's very easy for us to get when we're sitting somewhere with good internet connection. Can I just come in on that? So you, you what well, we've, accessibility is really important so you need to go where people already are not create another place so social media a video that's on YouTube or, or Facebook. or So if you're looking to connect with people, you need to go where people already exist rather than try and create something new. Yeah, and I know my colleague sat next to me who advocates for Wikipedia, et cetera. You know, we need to put our content and where people are looking for it. Rather yeah, than Wikipedia, OpenStreetMap, build a small website. Yeah, just to add on, I am an advocate for Wikimedia and Wikipedia, but just to... Uh, Nick, 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 tell us, tell us oh, who sorry, you are. Sorry, I'm Nick Shepherd, uh, University of Leeds Library as well, working with Claire. Um, and that is a scalable infrastructure that's already in place. Uh, yes. And, and it's not just Wikipedia as well, you know, there's Wikimedia Commons, there's Wikidata, Linkdata, you know, there's a huge ecosystem there. Um, but I just wanted to comment as well in the context of the question from the colleague in Malawi. There is an initiative actually to send... Wikipedia out on disk, you know, so you can actually access Wikipedia, for example. Encarta. Um, yeah, Encarta, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> effectively. So th th I think, that, I don't know a huge amount about it, but there are initiatives around that. So, um, yeah. Nick, thank you very much. Let's come to the middle. Next row up. Brilliant, there we go. Hey. My name is Julianne Granley. I'm from International Council for Open and Distance Education. 
I, I really like this conversation about infrastructure, um, but I wanted to ask if we can bring it even further back or even to more concrete uh, and ask about access to the internet. Because we can say we can do things without internet, or we can meet people in different spaces. People have access to social media because they have phones. OK. But what still, they, the price of data to access anything is insane in, my, in so many places, and it's not affordable. And I think in a conversation where we're talking about knowledge equity, it's not just about getting it to people in different ways, uh, but the opportunity people have to actually receive overall. Um, I'm not sh entirely sure what the question is here, uh, more of a statement of <laughs> how can we... Uh, Welcome to an we... academic community institution. Let's find the hardest question possible <laughs> and then ask it of everybody. Yeah. No, but how does uh, open and also the knowledge equity network support internet as part of infrastructure? Thank you very much. I think I think there's a, a really important question. So we've got, the, there was the, the the gentleman at the back on on my right. I'll come to you in a minute. You've got to get. So do you, let Tom stop, stop, stop. Let this gentleman here ask his question. I, thank you. I'm I'm Giron, and I've I've worked um, in, in the, a, a lot in the humanitarian space, and I, I wanted to make two quick comments and reflecting a little bit of the radical open data and, and, and mention some words of caution as well. So first of all, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights actually mentioned data. It says everybody has the right of freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas throughout any media, regardless of the frontiers. This was written before the internet, and it already has the affordance of kind of talking about human rights and data in a way, and I think it's important to, to mention that. At the same time, uh, data is biased often. Data can be abused and misused, and we've seen many examples where uh, data has not only personally identifiable people and that has led to people being killed, or, uh, but also groups of people. So for example, with cell phone data, one can map um, a country, and you can see that uh, when it is uh, when it's Ramadan, then the people will stay at home. So you know where the Muslim areas are, and those inf those information databases can lead to, uh, to to actions between people. So I just want to be cautious about the idea that sharing data uh, openly. Yes, absolutely, but we need a responsible way of doing that. I think data responsibility needs to come into this conversation. Thank you very much. And, and the next gentleman along, thank you. Thank you. Um, Does he want to say something online? Professor Anuranshu Chandaji, uh, Dean for Digital Transformation, University of Leeds. Just going to respond to our colleague in Malawi in terms of the question that was raised. And I think open education, or open innovation can be enacted without the need for technology. Absolutely, yes. Uh, we did a work uh, with sort of Sierra Leone and Liberia during the uh, Ebola pandemic, in which we use community workers, health workers, to train uh, sort of health workforce there in villages. However, working with them, we also found a way that it's hard to scale up that training at a rapid pace unless you find a technological solutions to do it. So, it's collectively working together with the local government, there are ways in which you can empower sort of volunteer groups to use technology which sort of goes out and be, is enacted in a non-technological way in a community setting which you can bring back. So the data still flows back in terms of improving um, uh, decision making at a regional level. So there, there are ways in which you can do that. And I completely agree to the fact that act of innovation needs to happen in community settings where you have the stakeholders and not ask them to come somewhere else. So in this case, mosques, temples, community, sort of village uh, homes. So I think, I think that there are really, really good established models. And I think uh, even uh, that there are technologies which can, be work, which can easily work uh, offline that's, that's available that, that could deliver training and, and education in, in remote areas without the need for internet which could be prepackaged and, and sort of scaled up in, in that particular sense. So there, 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 there are quite a, quite, quite, quite a range of options there, but in all, in all cases, co-creating with the local communities in places where they actively participate is the best way to take this forward and scale up. 
Thank you very much. Um, Jan Mario, you, you had a, uh, a, a contribution. I just wanted to make a quick comment on uh, the question raised by uh, our um, three colleagues ago. <laughs> the question about, uh, the, the comment about uh, the cost of data packages for students in parts of the world where uh, the web is accessed primarily through the phone. That's a reality with which we uh, deal regularly in the work that we do. And I just wanted to make a quick comment saying that higher education institutions have a role to play in that situation because uh, the students that we, we work with uh, do not want to download massive amounts of data when they're not at the university, but when they are at the university, they can. So there's this uh, you know, asynchronicity to take into account uh, when when we work with them, but but their higher education institution play the role of giving them access when when they are in reach of the network of of the institution. Just a simple comment of practicality. Thank you, Nick. Nick, over to you. Hi, uh, Nick Shepherd again, University of Leeds. Um, I just wanted to pick up on. Uh, you know, go to where people are in, in terms of data, which is, is valuable. But there's a data literacy aspect to this as well, I think, potentially. <coughs> but a story where, you know, phones were being um, distributed and under what model, I'm not sure, in, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, w loaded with Facebook. And then Facebook is the web, you know, it's not, or Google, or Twitter, or whatever it is. And that's not open infrastructure, is it, really? I mean, it's... It, 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 and in a way that perhaps Wikimedia is uh, more open. Obviously, that's uh, got its own issues. But, you know, the, the, there's so much nuance in this in terms of how people access data and their awareness of the data that they're accessing, um, both locally and, and more internationally. And the other point, just on... Um, I did have a conversation with Nick Plant, with um, the CEO of JISC, I think she's here, but she was talking about... Eduroam in particular, and they were doing some work with trying to get uh, boosters into towns for Eduroam. Um, but obviously that is only people that are part of the university system. Again, it's a start, as she yep. put it. But even there, I think only seven councils of all the ones that, that approached had got back in touch. Um, but that does illustrate the, the point. And then I suppose on that as well, this Starlink, I mean, we don't want to talk about Elon Musk perhaps too much, again, in terms of open infrastructure and Twitter. But, you know, the Ukrainian situation and Starlink and, you know, there's huge infrastructural challenges there. So I'm not perhaps helping there, but, you know, the, 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 it sort of complicates the thing. As you say, Paul, you know, welcome to an academic conference. It just get, it, <laughs> yes. I'm just, I'm just going to recommend that you all um, go away and build a website and um, put your data in a repo and put a link to that on your website. <laughs> and then write some blogs that say, this is what we did and this is how we did it. But all of these points are completely relevant and we need to think about them, as well as doing. So one of the other third parts is the, the classic, and uh, is that we think too much and don't do. Nick, thank you very much. We've got, I've got a, an online question from Jackie. And I'm hoping Jackie's going to magically appear. <laughs> Uh, there we go, Jackie, oh. go for it. Hi, hope there's not too much delay. I'm um, Jackie Proven, Head of Open Research at University of St Andrews. Um, I was just really going to respond to the final provocation of how we transcend current infrastructures. Um, and one thing that, that libraries can do, or even individual teams, individual people even, is advocate for integrating or linking up open um, systems, open infrastructures with proprietary systems. So an example might be the institution has decided to go with a proprietary research information system. Um, it may be possible to keep that linked up with an open source repository um, and continue um, hard as it might be to, to keep that open um, infrastructure as part of your outward facing um, showcase of, of research outputs. So um, yeah, that was that was my point. I'd be interested if anyone else has examples of, of that kind of thing. Thank you very much, Jackie. <laughs> Masood, did you, did you 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 had your hand up? And Tom's all the way at the back, so he's going to have to go. Going for a little run here. <laughs> I 
I think my, sorry, I'm Smasood Khokar. I'm the university librarian here, here at the University of Leeds. Just to respond to Jackie's point, uh, firstly, I wholeheartedly agree. And secondly, uh, University of Leeds, Sheffield and York are all great examples of exactly that. Um, while the conversations were going on, I was thinking about the word infrastructure and actually what does the kind of overarching understanding of infrastructure. If you think about our structures as, as a kind of institutional infrastructure, I think we, we can really do something different about reward mechanisms around open education. And it's not something that we've yet got into our academic promotion criteria, into our reward models, into even getting some sabbaticals out to write open textbooks or open educational resources. And we've seen that kind of movement on open research, and I think there are lots of lessons on that which, which allow us to do something similar. Um, we also can change some of our existing processes. So within the existing infrastructure processes, we don't have to go radically different. So a good example of this would be lots of universities are doing fully online education. Can we integrate thinking about open within those processes? And that allows people to at least build the cultural and contextual knowledge around open um, while they're doing what they're doing, which I think is quite an important aspect for a long-term outcome here. I would also argue that we don't have to reinvent certain things. We have some amazing open infrastructures. Nick's mentioned Wikipedia. GitHub is another really good example. And when we are producing research software or student software or lots of other things, why don't we integrate GitHub or GitHub Enterprise or whichever avenue we want to go with into our curriculum design itself, into promotions of that kind of output, and then further promote our corporate data where <coughs> we can in that context as well. Southampton's done some really interesting work on that ages ago where they published all of their corporate data, including all of their, what was on the menu of their cafes and everything else. And some amazing student innovations came out of that. Just, they just needed the data. They didn't need any incentive. They didn't need anything else. Just that innovation sparked on, no, oh, let's create some amazing menu choices for someone with this dietary restriction or someone like that. It's just really brilliant to see that. So I think we, we do have, a level of data responsibility, but we also have a level of data innovation aspects that we need around that. Um, and then the last thing I was going to add was actually, which, which goes to Jackie's point, we do have a responsibility to sign appropriate agreements uh, when we are dealing with other ed tech vendors or other things. I think in the research landscape, we, we miss the boat by some margin. In the education landscape, we still have a very strong chance to reshape that. And let's let's not miss the boat on this one as well. Okay. Masood, thank you very much. Right, we've got a question at the back, a question in the middle, and there's a question online. I'm going to go to the online one whilst Tom runs to the back. Kim Sunderdale. Kim. Hi, thanks. Uh, thank everybody for the very inspirational speeches. I was especially very interested in the virtual learning experience, the global learning experience from the poll. So I'm going to look into that further. Uh, I just wanted to react uh, to what Jackie uh, stated before uh, on uh, uh, using more open software. Uh, at our university, we have to transition soon to a new learning management system. Uh, and what I found really interesting is that we're now having a university-wide discussion about whether we want to incorporate uh, using open software as a principle um, in these kinds of decisions. Um, so rather than going to a commercial party uh, because of reasons of privacy and security and such, uh, really making the value-based decision that those kinds of uh, systems should be open source. And so we're not there that we have an answer yet, uh, but I think that having that discussion is very uh, interesting. And uh, maybe that's inspiring uh, to others to include um, being open as part of your uh, ICT principles. Kim, thank you very much. OK, the microphone's come to the middle. Hi again. Um, I wanted to just say something about uh, repositories for all OERs, so we're not we're a bit above, like more targeted than the open conversation in general. So uh, I am coordinating something called the Encore Network, which is a European network for OER, and uh, part of the 
work that's going on is they've been looking at repositories and interoperability and the challenges there with infrastructure. And for repositories specifically, so the way we uh, digest or read or find OERs, they've, the proposal have come with two quite different proposals, or rather two different scenarios of how to, to do this technological integration of the different repositories. Uh, anyone that has looked for OERs know that there is a million and four ways to find them, and there's a million and four ways to evaluate quality and uh, etc. And that's a whole different co conversation. But uh, just to say that the two approaches that uh, we are currently discussing is scenario one, which is a minimum we call minimal invasive embedding. So this is where you can map through different repositories and different services into an LMS to a repository onwards and around. The other is uh, the more traditional umbrella approach where every OER that exists or in a repository is brought into a separate place, an umbrella, and can be viewed there. So this is just to add something to the discussion on the infrastructure necessary to, to become open or use open more widely. Uh, certainly, there's challenges with both models and opportunities with both. Uh, but I just want to say that the, we should also remember to think about that. Thank you, thank you very much. Right, OK, we've got about 10 minutes to go. So what I'm going to try and do um, is use a flip chart to capture what I think you've been saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then when I've written it up, you can then, my experience of this is you'll all chip in and refine it for me, which is, which is absolutely what we're after. <coughs> um, so I think, I think the first uh, message I'm getting is that you need to um, create a space for people to come that's open, that's welcoming, whether that be a room or be it online. Okay, create a space that's... What else did I note down? Uh, um, that people share their work. I think there's one thing that I've heard. Um, I'll help you. Go for it. Three things. Um, fun teams, not projects. Build websites. <laughs> and publish there, but with great examples. And don't forget maintenance. Because someone's got to maintain all this in the future. That'll be my three things. Great space. Okay. Okay. So let, 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 Claire, let Claire say her piece, because she's got, <laughs> she's got the microphone. Um, hi, it's Claire again. I think it's um, sustainability is key for this. And um, I was, I've just been looking at um, something that was um, published in 2017 from libraries in the States from Indiana, the 2.5 commitment. And that is a, a commitment to funding open source. And that's what they um, talked about, a 2.5 of library budgets. But you have to keep, if you're doing open, and this is where we've seen great projects and great things, and, it, and they've, they've closed... A great, a really good examples in the OER space and it needs to be a long-term commitment to make things sustainable and keep going and that's where we haven't seen that necessarily in the open infrastructure. It needs to be a long-term <coughs> commitment and that's what I would like to see come out of Ken is that long-term commitment to open infrastructure. So you're sort of agreeing with me, aren't we? Fun teams <laughs> and don't forget maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Masood, were you going to add something? I was just reminding of the point about data responsibility because that then links into privacy but also links with responsible innovation. Right, okay. So th there's something about... Um, oh, I'm, forgive my words. They need, this needs better wor words. Um, There's, I've, I've said identify rules. I'm not sure that's right, but it's something like identify rules for responsible data sharing. And curation. 
sharing and creation of data. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. <laughs> um, okay, what else have I got here? Uh, um, can I give you another problem? Is that helpful? <laughs> Not at the moment, no. <laughs> um, just, uh, I'm thinking of the, Nick Shepard again at least, the, the questions that was posed by the online speaker, for, so I forget his name, um, one of which was the infrastructural barriers, and I was a bit of a chat with Paul at lunchtime around the barriers I think we have at an institutional level in terms of agility. You know, it's very difficult to be agile. We've got these big systems that need managing um, decision making through committees, etc., etc. So, you know, the agile approach is great, but I'm not sure how we can do that effectively in a university, especially consortia of universities like Ken is proposing. So if you uh, look at the health data review that Ben Goldacre did, there are a load of great recommendations and processes that the Goldacre review has done for health data, which would be very, very applicable to this. And he basically says, fund teams, not projects. Curate, um, don't fire and forget, all of that sort of thing. So it's, that's all written down. So the Bender Goldacre review would be a good reference case for this. No, that, thanks, because that, that does really resonate, that fund teams, not projects. And that's what I think was Claire was getting at. The problem is we have these projects. They come and go and they've gone. But, yeah. and, you know, and the skills are still there and the people are still there. So it's, it's yeah. about funding those teams. Yeah. So yeah, so there's a common themes across lots of projects, which you know, ethics, responsibility, <coughs> maintenance, and you need to ring fence that across all the projects, and that just gets done by a team that learns and does and improves over time, and you take away the responsibility for delivering that from the researchers, but then you get more efficient, as you, and you learn as you go. So the, the way that I've, I've tried to capture this in what I've got here is that um, the, there's, there's the need to integrate systems but it's not about integrating. If you fund the team, the team will integrate the systems for you and the team will potentially do the, the sustainability. But if you fund the project, the project finishes and poof. Yep, exactly. Of course, it's not just one team in a university, there's loads of them. So. <laughs> yeah, but this, yeah, the, the, yeah. So thanks for that. <laughs> So that, that's where I've got to. I'm conscious I haven't got the, I haven't woven OERs in there. If you can see where it fits, tell me. What's an OER? Open Educational Resource. Of course it is, yeah. Um. <laughs> does, that, does that get delivered by a MOOC, I guess? Is that sort of thing? For is instance, it? yeah. yeah. Um, it's any resource that's used to educate. So it could be a video, it could be a PDF, it could be yep. whatever. Um, how does it fit? It's more, I guess the point was the infrastructure to find and use um, Resources, right? Um, but did just put it on the web, and then you. It's all on the web. Yeah, that's how you find it. <laughs> so just as long as it's indexed by Google, and you, 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 that's where I would put it, and then you let the search engine find it. I would. Definitely argue. Don't hide we could it, don't definitely hide have it, this don't conversation, hide it but passwords and yeah. things there like is that. A lot, wall garden. There's yeah. a lot of challenges with the amount of resources out there and mm -hmm. how to find and how to um, use yep. resources, unfortunately. That's why you need a curator like Claire to tell you what's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, got a couple of minutes left. I. Uh, Jed, have you got anything that you've noted down that you think we need to build into? I think that. <laughs> I, I think I think that what you've got on says it says it all. I, I think um, it's it essentially boiling it down is creation cu curation includes maintenance has to. Um, and it's long-term commitment. I mean, if we're boiling these down to kind of um, to kind of the, the key messages, those are the ones that seem to stand out for me. And I get, I've not detected any. You know, there's the specific barriers that might be that might be in place that, that we might be able to think about in terms of you know small-scale actions. Because actually, these are these can be these are mostly big big stage actions. So I think, you know, it's identifying those small-scale barriers that we can act on easily. And can I just add something on the building websites that 
um, I think an experiment that somebody in Chem needs to do is how you can build a low or no code um, website for researchers to start to publish their work. That would be a really good experiment for somebody to do out of Ken. Your third C there is commitment. So the well, third, are we going to have three Cs? You've got to have three Cs. Yeah, so yeah. The third C is commitment, which implies all the sustainability achievements. Oh, look at that, yes. So, so there's a, I presume you're in the business school and yeah. No. <laughs> it's, it's alliteration, I think, yeah. the driving force here. That's right. um, the, the other thing that I think that it's kind of a theme that's run through what's been said is, is, is examples. If you've, got exam if you've got a case study, a set of examples that you can yeah. show people, you can illustrate what you can do. Social proof, that's what you want. Yeah. Okay. It happens all the time, doesn't it? Yeah, but that's you need social proof of what works. <coughs> and that's 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 what we were getting from um, Gian Mario at the beginning was was his, yeah. his provocation was some examples of what actually works in practice. Um, right, that brings us to quarter past three. So thank you all very much indeed. Um, thank you for engaging with the discussion. I think, I think we've got something we can work with. Um, I will see what Nick Plant makes of it all when he tries to bring it all together. Thank you. Please, please go on and enjoy your refreshments.